Hey everyone, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. Thank you for joining us. We really do appreciate it. In this episode, we're gonna talk about all things metabolism. Really, all of the things. It's a huge topic and a lot to unpack. Uh, we're gonna wrap up with some community form checks and we're gonna tell you how you can submit your own form check or your own questions to be answered right here on our YouTube channel. So stay tuned to the end of the video for that. But for right now, let's get into metabolism. Huge topic, hold on to your butts. Hold on to your butts. Uh, so Dan Ludwig asks, what's the deal with metabolism? I feel like this is a Jerry Seinfeld reference. Uh, and he says, I'm always hearing about people talk about what speeds up or slows down metabolism, and it's practically all conflicting. I would like to know what to say to these people. Uh, so yeah, this is a very interesting question, a lot going on. And again, like I said, a lot of information that we'll have to go over. So first, let's go over some definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so metabolism is the sum of all biochemical processes that occur within an organism. This includes both anabolic and catabolic uh, processes. Processes. So anabolic is building up of substances and catabolic is breaking down of substances. In humans, a metabolism typically refers to the breakdown of food and its transformation into energy. In a more scientific uh, terms, we break down the energy that's stored in macronutrients, so carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and alcohol, and we release that energy as either heat or chemical energy. Chemical energy in this case usually being ATP or adenosine triphosphate. ATP is this universal currency uh, that we use to power different reactions in all of the tissues of the body. So if a reaction requires energy, we're using ATP or a uh, breakdown product of that to power those reactions in the body. So calories are a measure of energy. Calorie with a small c represents the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius at one atmospheric pressure, whereas calorie with a large c, which is the one that we use when discussing the caloric uh, uh, quantity of food and the calories you burn in a given day, uh, that actually represents a thousand of the calories with a small c. So this is basically the energy that's required to raise the temperature of a thousand grams or one kilo or one liter of water by one degree Celsius at one atmospheric pressure. So again, in the food and beverage industry, and when we talk about uh, people's metabolic rates, we're always talking about big C, but and sometimes you can actually hear this referred to as a kilocalorie or a kcal. Um, and there's actually a cool backstory as to how the terms calorie with a little c and calorie with a big c kind of came to be. Um, there's also some disagreement, as you might expect, in the scientific realm about uh, if we should be using these in the scientific literature. And in fact, there's a big push where uh, that people want us to only use uh, the term, uh, the SI unit for energy, which is joule. But that's for a different vlog. If you want to read the backstory and kind of this conjecture, I've linked uh, a paper in the description below. It's the first one there. Okay, so in any event, humans consume food whose macronutrients contain energy, uh, which are subsequently transformed into either heat or chemical energy, ATP, like we just talked about, uh, which, uh, along with any energy stores in the body, provide fuel for all of the biochemical functions uh, necessary to sustain life and perform physical activities, which again is measured in calories with a big C. Um, the total amount of energy used in a day is termed the total daily energy expenditure, or TDEE, and has three very originally named components. The first is the resting metabolic rate, so RMR. Sometimes that's confused with basal metabolic rate, but they are not the same things. Uh, thermic effect of food is the second component of the total daily energy expenditure. That's abbreviated as TEF. And the third component of your total daily energy expenditure is the ex energy expenditure of physical activity, or EPA. Uh, let's define each of these things, and along the way we can discuss what increases, what decreases them, and how to modify them for uh, best outcomes. So we said that the first component of the total daily energy expenditure is resting metabolic rate, or RMR, and then that is slightly different than BMR, or basal metabolic rate. Uh, both of these things refer to the amount of calories uh, that are required per day. Uh, to sustain basic life processes and stay awake. However, BMR or basal metabolic rate is measured a little more precisely, has a little more extensive sort of process to get that number. So you have to be fasted for 12 hours, lying down, need to be relaxed. It's usually start uh, taken, uh, the measurement's taken shortly after you wake up and it's in a thermoneutral environment, meaning it's not hot or not cold because that makes you burn less or more calories as we'll talk about later. Um, in any event, when you measure BMR, which again is like, 
a little bit more precise version of this resting metabolic rate, it accounts for about 50 to 70% of your total daily energy expenditure. So of those three things, BMR ends up being this huge, huge component. Uh, BMR, again, is often confused with resting metabolic rate or RMR, but they're slightly different. Again, RMR doesn't require a 12-hour fast, usually just a two to four-hour fast prior uh, to measuring it. And in practice, this is usually represented by an overnight fast. So when people show up to the lab in the morning to get their RMR measured, it's usually at just after an overnight fast. Um, in any event, the RMR calculations end up being about 10% higher than the BMR calculations. And so instead of representing 50 to 70% of your total daily energy expenditure, RMR tends to represent 60 to 80 percent of your total daily energy expenditure. Again, of the three components, uh, BMR, uh, TEF, and EEPA, so that energy expen expenditure of physical activity, your BMR and RMR represent the largest component of those three uh, for your total daily energy expenditure. Uh, so we'll uh, be exclusively discussing resting metabolic rate for the rest of this particular discussion. And about 50 to 70% of it, some studies quoting even up to 80% of that is determined by your lean body mass. But the main players here are, besides lean body mass, are gonna be your total body weight and then also age. Although again, that tends to influence your lean body mass. Uh, the rest of this variation in uh, uh, resting metabolic rate, so the other you know, 30 to 50% is uh, due to race, uh, different genetic traits and medical conditions, including both acute and chronic illnesses, and then environment. Uh, we can use a bunch of different equations to calculate resting metabolic rate. Um, there are two equations that are basically thought to have the lowest amount of error in them, meaning that they're within about 200 calories or less uh, of the tested values uh, most of the time. And these are the Mifflin and St. Gior equations, which I've put down in the uh, in the description below. Uh, for me, you know, the uh, the main variables rather in in these equations are weight, height, age, and for me, it actually says that I would uh, be expending about 1,873 calories a day just for my RMR. And again, that's about that's one of the three components that uh, uh, total uh, that combines together to give you your total daily energy expenditure. So people on the internet will say, "Oh my gosh, that's so low," but honestly, that's just the energy that's required to maintain my life functions and to stay awake for a given day um, that has nothing to do with physical activity, has nothing to do with how many calories it takes for me to, you know, digest, metabolize and store uh, the energy from food. So that actually makes sense. So after we calculate our RMR, if we're up to doing that, we can kind of separate the different components that contribute to resting metabolic rate into modifiable and unmodifiable, uh, and then discuss how each of these uh, tends to alter the resting metabolic rate. Uh, for the modifiable components, the biggest influencer, again, as we alluded to earlier, is lean body mass, which predicts about you know 80% of one's resting metabolic rate. Uh, additionally, anything that changes lean body mass, such as resistance training, weight loss, weight gain through overfeeding or and or resistance training uh, can have significant impacts on resting metabolic rate. In fact, lean body mass is such a strong predictor of the resting metabolic rate that calculations of metabolic rate per kilo are repeatedly described in the literature. Uh, one kilo of lean body mass burns about 21 calories per day without any meaningful activity. Uh, in addition, with uh, activity, lean body mass tends to burn even more calories than that. And we'll talk about that in the physical activity section. Uh, with respect to body weight in general, those with a higher body weight will have a higher resting metabolic rate for any given level of lean body mass. So as a practical example, a 200 pound guy at 20% body fat, who's got about 160 pounds of lean body mass, will have a higher resting metabolic rate than a 190 pound guy at 16% body fat, who also has about 160 pounds of lean body mass. Uh, that's due to the additional metabolic activity Activity of adipose tissue, which we'll actually cover in some detail later. But again, if you weigh more for a given amount of lean body mass, your resting metabolic rate is likely to be higher. So this is a common thing that people will often say on the internet that, oh, if you have a higher body fat level or if you weigh more but don't carry uh, any additional lean body mass, your metabolic rate is going to be down. You're going to have a low meta or slow metabolism. But that's not really uh, what we see when we review the evidence. Um, Additionally, with respect to gaining or losing weight, weight loss tends to reduce uh, resting metabolic rate to some degree. And this can differ based on the amount lost, the rate of the weight loss, and the methods used, surgery versus calorie restriction, uh, and then additional uh, individual differences 
in physiology. So there was an interesting study that compared those who underwent a bariatric procedure for weight loss and compared them to the Biggest Loser contestants from one of those seasons of the television show and basically compared their uh, how fast they lost weight and sort of changes they had in their RMR. This provides some answers here for the questions that we have. So in the surgical group, those folks lost about six kilos of lean body mass, 9% body fat, going from 48% to 39% body fat, and nearly 30 kilos of body weight from baseline to their seven-month follow-up. Their resting metabolic rates on average decreased from 2,120 calories to 1,754 calories, or basically it declined by about 374 calories. The Biggest Loser contestants, on the other hand, lost 7.5 kilos of lean body mass, 50 kilos of body weight, and 20% body fat, going from 50% to 30% body fat, and saw a decrease in their RMR from 2,474 calories to 1,857 calories, or a total decrease of about 617 calories. And you compare that, it's a lot more calorie decrease than the surgical groups uh, uh, saw. But why is this? Well, a few things stick out here, namely the rate of weight loss and the amount of body fat loss. So faster rates of weight loss tend to reduce the resting metabolic rate uh, more than slower rates of weight loss. This is due to a couple different reasons. One, potentially more lean body mass loss, which we saw here. So they lost an extra kilo and a half. We know that's a very important component of the resting metabolic rate. And also more weight loss overall in general. So the biggest loser contestants were measured at uh, the, the data we have here is from a six month follow up and they had lost 50 kilos or 110 pounds uh, body weight. And that's compared to the 30 kilos or 66 pounds body weight that the surgical group saw at seven months. So they lost more weight. They also lost more lean body mass, extra kilo and a half. Um, so both of those, we would predict a greater decrease in resting metabolic rate just from those two facts alone. Um, even when total amount of weight and lean body mass losses are the same, usually faster rates of loss tend to produce a slightly larger decrease in resting metabolic rate. And this is thought to be due to some very complex physiology that has to do with maintaining certain homeostatic uh, uh, set points as far as um, body fat stores and protein stores. And that is for another vlog. But uh, what the takeaway from this is the faster the weight loss, we expect the resting metabolic rate to drop a little bit faster than if it took longer to lose that same amount of weight. Um, additionally, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, fat tissue is pretty metabolically active, but not uniformly. What this means is that fat tissue has different metabolic rates depending on where it's at. In general, abdominal or visceral fat tissue, so that belly fat, is more metabolically active than fat tissue that's stored elsewhere, so like in the periphery. Uh, it has higher blood flow, catecholamine receptor density, and and a bunch of other different things that makes it burn more calories than if it were somewhere else in the body. So with greater reductions in fat stores and greater reductions in weight, we expect to see more uh, uh, visceral or uh, abdominal adipose tissue loss. And we'd expect subsequently a greater reduction in resting metabolic rate because you lost more belly fat. So the TLDR of that is if you lose one kilo or 2.2 pounds of body fat from your belly compared to losing that same kilo or 2.2 pounds from the periphery, we would expect your resting metabolic rate to drop more due to the increased metabolic activity that's intrinsic to that uh, abdominal adipose tissue compared to that in the periphery. Clinically, this reduction in resting metabolic rate may or may not be important, as we're less concerned about the actual resting metabolic rate itself than we are the outcomes that affect a person's disease risk profile, i.e. the amount of distribution, the amount and distribution of their body fat uh, by proxy, their waist circumference, what that measurement is, uh, how much lean body mass they're carrying, what is their fitness level, and other markers of disease. We also have uh, data suggesting that rate of weight loss doesn't really influence compliance negatively. So in short, I'm not really sure that we should care about the resting metabolic rate going down per se, unless it ultimately affects compliance, and the data on that's pretty messy. Uh, knowing that uh, the RMR does go down, however, may influence what additional steps that we take in order to counter the decrease, and that might pertain to different exercise interventions um, to either increase or maintain lean body mass, for instance. Uh, so we talked about the modifiable components of resting metabolic rate. Let's talk about the unmodifiable components. Uh, and these, again, are genetics, environment, pre-existing weight loss history, and age. Together, these make up about 20% of someone's resting metabolic rate, with the other 80% or so uh, due to mainly lean body mass levels. Uh, with respect to genetics, a large body of evidence suggests that there are heritable components, some of which are overrepresented in particular racial groups that ultimately will influence somebody's uh, RMR, their thermic effect of food, so how 
many calories it takes to break down, metabolize, store uh, different food sources and even their physical activity levels. Yes, even your physical activity levels are somehow uh, are in some ways genetically influenced. Given that there's not much that we can do about this, short of hijacking some CRISPR technology, we won't spend too much time here, but if you're interested in this stuff, I've linked a paper by Bouchard et et al. It's actually pretty old. It's from 1993, but it was freely available, so you guys can read the whole text, and it lays a really nice groundwork for talking about different genetic components to uh, that go into metabolic rate and thermic effect of food and also even your physical activity level. So I would start there, and you can find a whole bunch of new stuff on here, and if you have access to different medical journals, then you can go there. There, but this one I liked because it was freely available and pretty accessible. Environment can also impact uh, an individual's resting metabolic rate. Populations in warmer climates tend to have a lower resting metabolic rate than those who live in a colder environment, even when controlling for body size and body composition. Interestingly, those who live in colder climates, uh, i.e. ones with cold, snowy winters, they have higher rates of obesity than those in less harsh conditions in a dose-dependent fashion. Uh, this is thought to be due to changes in physical activity levels as the weather changes. So even though the folks in a warmer climate tended to have a lower resting metabolic rate, the actual obesity rate was higher uh, in the colder climates who had a higher resting metabolic rate, suggesting again that resting metabolic rate isn't, you know, the end all be all when it comes to obesity rates or even managing obesity to begin with. Uh, socioeconomic status can also impact the resting metabolic rate and those who are chronically undernourished uh, with a low socioeconomic status have a much lower resting metabolic rate than those with similar levels of calorie intake and lean body mass levels but who have a higher uh, uh, socioeconomic status. So said a different way, those with low BMIs but who are from a good socioeconomic background and have access to food will have similar resting metabolic rates to well-nourished individuals when corrected for lean body mass. Finally, age can have a significant effect on resting metabolic rate with declines in mid to late life due to decreases in fat-free mass and increased fat mass. That said, the preservation or increases in fat-free mass, muscle tissue being the main one, tend to bolster against this decrease in resting metabolic rate. Conversely, older folks who are losing fat-free mass who need to train, but who maintain high metabolic rates have higher than expected uh, mortality rates, likely due to disease or other pathology. Uh, For more on that, I linked uh, Fabry et al.'s paper uh, from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. It is fascinating. Again, if you have time and you want to nerd out on this, I would definitely check that out. Now, before moving on to the other two uh, major components of total daily energy expenditure, uh, we have to discuss the elephant in the room. Sex. Uh, nearly every calculator that purports to spit out a resting metabolic rate or total daily energy expenditure has an input for gender, yet this isn't entirely evidence-based. It is established that, on average, resting metabolic rate tends to be higher absolutely in men than women, but... By now, you already know why, and that's due to lean body mass. As early as the 1980s in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings Journal on resting metabolic rate calculations, there was hard evidence suggesting that gender played no direct role in determining resting metabolic rate, as lean body mass and body weight overall were shown to spit out accurate resting metabolic rates without any sort of gender input. A follow-up study by Buckholtz et al., which I've linked below in the description, provided further support that lean body mass differences between men and women, when present, were able to wholly explain differences in resting metabolic rate. And this jives with our current knowledge on how gender influences strength performance and training responses, which is that gender doesn't influence strength, hypertrophy, or performance significantly, but rather individual genetic, psychological, and social components, regardless of gender, are responsible for differences in training outcomes. The second component of total daily energy expenditure is the thermic effect of food aka diet-induced thermogenesis or a specific effect of food. Basically, this represents the amount of energy, aka calories with a big C, that the body uses in digesting, absorbing, transporting, metabolizing, and storing energy from food. The most commonly cited value for this TEF or thermic effect of food is 10% of a person's calorie intake. So 300 calories would be equivalent to the TEF uh, for a person eating about 3,000 calories per day. Uh, TEF can be increased by eating more protein and dietary fiber, both of which end up being very satiating and potentially help improve results from dieting by improving compliance. Uh, Drinking water, especially cold water, has been said to increase metabolic rate and or help people lose weight. And indeed, there is some short-term data that could, in isolation, suggest these claims might have a kernel of truth in them. However, a 2016 review by Stuckey et al. in the journal Nutrients reviewed virtually all randomized controlled trials looking at water intake and metabolic rate, energy expenditure, energy intake, and fat oxidation rates, and found that when looking at hard outcomes over days and weeks, those claims about water helping metabolism don't really hold 
water. Okay, that was bad. But really, this guy looked at 134 different randomized controlled trials in this thing, and he found that of the 115 different effects seen from drinking water uh, in all these randomized controlled trials, over 80 of them were null or zero effect. That said, drinking water tends to be uh, useful in the following two instances. If you're going to drink water uh, instead of uh, cal calorie-containing beverages, if you're not dieting, uh, specifically not in a calorie-reduced state, um, but you're otherwise consuming low glycemic, low-fat foods, ad libitum, so again, you're just eating these foods without any sort of specific restriction, then drinking water over a calorie-containing beverage is probably a good idea. Uh, if you are obese and you are in a calorie-restricted diet, increasing uh, the amount of water you drink by about a liter per day uh, may help you lose weight, um, but that's not necessarily because you, it increases your metabolism. It may increase fat oxidation rates for reasons we don't completely understand. So those are the two instances that we really have decent data uh, for water maybe improving outcomes. If you're not on a strict diet, but you're replacing calorie containing beverages with water, that seems to be a good idea. And then if you're uh, overweight or obese and you're trying to lose weight, um, if you increase your water by about a liter per day, that might uh, improve your outcomes there. Uh, overfeeding can also increase the thermic effect of food prior to the body weight change which happens when you overfeed for a sustained period of time. Uh, experimental data reliably shows this, especially in subjects who increase their dietary protein intake or dietary carbohydrate intake, uh, along with dietary fiber. Those, those things tend to increase the thermic effect of food, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, that said, sustained increases in calorie intake will, as you might have guessed, produce increases in body weight with increases in both fat mass and fat-free mass. And as the name says, fat-free mass is everything that's not fat. So that includes skeletal muscle tissue, that includes body water that includes organ uh, uh, tissues, etc. Increased body weight, again, in general, increases resting metabolic rate. And then to the degree that lean body mass from muscle, bone, organ tissues, and other non-water components increase, RMR can go up considerably. So again, that's what happens in a lot of these overfeeding studies the, where the calorie surplus is sustained for a, a period of time. In general, overfeeding studies in sedentary populations using protein intakes around 10 to 15 percent of the total uh, daily calorie intake, uh, thus the calorie surplus primarily comes from carbohydrates and fats, uh, tend to produce weight gain that is like 60 to 70 percent fat mass, and the majority of the fat-free mass that is gained is from water. Uh, there's also no difference in the amount of fat stored when the excess is primarily carbohydrate or primarily fat uh, when we look at long-term sort of studies, so studies that are two weeks or longer in duration. Um, Overfeeding studies that use a higher protein intake, uh, plus or minus resistance training, improve this ratio with uh, 30 to 60% of the weight uh, that's gained coming from fat mass with a wide variation amongst individuals for the amount of skeletal muscle mass increase. And, you know, finally, there doesn't appear to be any real difference in muscle mass increases for uh, larger calorie surpluses. So if you're at 20% increase in calories versus 60% increase in calories, the muscle mass doesn't tend to change that much, but the amount of fat that you gain does tend to change uh, uh, when you do that. The higher the calorie increase, the more fat people gain on average. So in sum, the thermic effect of food contributes to a small amount of total daily energy expenditure. And this represents about 10% of your total daily calorie intake. Again, if you eat 3,000 calories a day, this is about 300 calories worth of energy that it contributes to your total daily energy expenditure. Uh, we can increase it by eating more protein, more dietary fiber, or eating more in general. However, sustained overfeeding will increase the resting metabolic rate in addition to the thermic effect of food because, again, we usually gain body weight. Uh, the final component of the total daily energy expenditure is the energy expenditure of physical activity or EPA. In general, EPA represents 20 to 40 percent of the total daily energy expenditure and is heavily influenced by the duration of exercise or activity, the intensity of the exercise or activity, the body mass of the individual participating in the exercise or activity, and the individual's efficiency in performing the exercise or activity. Longer duration of physical activity tends to increase total daily energy expenditure due to increased energy demand, which is exactly what you would think. At present, the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines for Adults that just came out uh, recommend 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week, yet 30% of the U.S. population does zero, and the, of the remaining 70%, less than half meets this recommendation. So increasing uh, the duration there could be helpful both for meeting the activity guidelines, but then also for increasing the uh, total amount of calories uh, burned per day or the 
total daily energy expenditure. Increasing the intensity of exercise can also increase total daily energy expenditure, and this has been studied extensively. Uh, for further reading, I'd recommend Laforgia et al's paper that I've linked below. I really think that's a good starting point to discuss all the different things that happens uh, when you increase the intensity of exercise. Uh, that being said, the umbrella term used to encompass all of the metabolic recovery processes that high intensity exercise invokes is called EPOC, or excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, which includes the restoration of acid-base balance, cardiovascular and pulmonary function recovery, body temperatures return to baseline, ATP replenishment, uh, etc. In general, these recovery processes occur within 24 hours or so, and it costs energy, calories with a big C in this case, uh, in addition to the actual calories burned during the exercise itself. A recent study by Sevitz and colleagues in Colorado found that a single bout of high-intensity exercise, in this case it was 30 seconds of sprinting on a stationary bike, followed by four minutes of complete rest for four rounds, increased total daily energy expenditure by about 220 calories. This number, 220 calories, is important uh, because we have other uh, data that suggest that increasing the total daily energy expenditure of a U.S. adult by 50 to 150 calories per day would prevent weight gain in 90% of the adults living here, as well as other industrialized countries. Aerobic exercise and resistance training have also been shown to increase total daily energy expenditure. Uh, you can think of resistance training as high intensity interval training on steroids. And so these all can be uh, or have the potential to be very useful in combating the obesity epidemic. The body mass of an individual is also very important in determining energy expenditure from physical activity, uh, as heavier individuals usually require more calories to do the same physical tasks as a lighter person in general. An additional caveat has to do with the efficiency of the individual, where more trained individuals will expend less energy to do tasks they are familiar with than untrained individuals. Uh, so let's consider a lifter who has been barbell training for 10 years consistently. He will require less energy to do a workout of similar volume, relative intensity, and duration than a person who is relatively untrained who is of similar size and body composition. In short, we expect calorie requirements for an activity to go down as an individual becomes more and more trained, which can be countered by increasing volume, increasing the duration, increasing training frequency, and or introducing novel training elements. In sum, the energy expenditure from physical activity, EPA, is uh, the third but an important element of total daily energy expenditure. We can increase uh, uh, both, so total daily energy expenditure and the energy expenditure from physical activity by adding duration, so more time exercising, adding intensity, uh, adding frequency, or unfamiliar exercises as needed to improve uh, uh, the amount of calories that we're burning from training. So overall, metabolism is how we convert the energy in food to power all of our biological functions. The amount of calories we use in a day, our total daily energy expenditure, is made up of three components, resting metabolic rate, or RMR, thermic effect of food, or TEF, and the energy expenditure of physical activity, or EPA. And each of these components can be modified through diet, exercise, and other lifestyle changes. We have covered a lot of material today, and I know that can be overwhelming, but I hope you learned something from watching. Uh, for further reading, please check out some of the studies and articles linked below, and let us know what you think about in the comments. All right, now let's move on to some of these community form checks and see what you guys sent in. All right, so we're kicking this off with Matthew. This is 340, he's gonna do a set of five. So we get to watch his walk out. Dude, nice touch and go deadlifts in the back, bro. Yeah, walk out looks pretty good. Yeah, you see the knees p poke forward at the bottom, just at the very, at the, you know, right as you get all the way to the bottom, you see them just kind of whoop, just a little bit further forward and then your back angle changes. I think your knees need to get further forward on the way down and you need to hold them there. Yeah, and then see so you end up good morning it, good morning, good morning it out of the bottom. So it also looks a little deep. So yeah, if I had to cue you, I would keep your knees forward out of the bottom so they don't shoot back and you end up good morning this thing. And uh, I would get them further forward first. So the knees go further forward first on the way down. You keep them there out of the bottom so you don't good morning mean the weight. Yeah, I'd probably take some weight off there because that looks like a five at 10. Yeah, that's what I would do. Hey, she's got lifting shoes on. Nice power perfect threes. I think it's 60 kilos. You know, that's not bad. That's pretty good depth. Yeah, that one was probably right at parallel, but you know, it's okay. Let's just look at this thing. Yeah, I would probably go uh, an inch lower, keep your knees out at the bottom, and then drive up with your butt. Yes, yeah, so that one was high. Yeah. I don't know what you're squatting now, because this is probably from a few weeks ago, 
But yeah, I would go down to 55, go about an inch lower and drive up with your butt first. You know, these presses aren't bad. It's just, it's going way in front of your face. So I would have you stay laid back when you press this thing and aim for your nose. The other thing is the bar is floating. I would actually have it rest on your chest. That's what I would have you try to do. Get the bar down on your chest. Don't try to bounce every rep like that. And then uh, keep your face back so it's like almost grazing your nose on the way up. Meet 365. You can tell the plates roll. You kick them forward right before you lift the weight. I don't know if it's due to the octagon plates or dodecahedron or whatever, how many sides they, these things have. Yeah, that one was better, third one, but you're forward because I saw your heels come up a little bit on that pole. So the bar is forward to the midfoot right now, which is still light for you, so it doesn't matter, but the bar needs to roll back and you need to not kick it forward. Even that one, you nudged it forward a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the weight's obviously light, but I would start with your hips a little higher, bar a little f further back in your stance, and I would really try to not deadlift with 12-sided plates. This is Adam, 485. Yeah, so you guys are gonna see this. I mean, it's thoracic spine unlocks, but lum lumbar spine was perfectly fine. I think that was a PR. What is this, 430? So, let's watch his thoracic spine. Just a little bit, but you see he's kyphotic anyway. So, like he's just, he's a kyphotic guy, not a lot, but some. Hips may be a little low here, Adam. Just a little bit. Yeah, like a half inch. So I'd probably just jack your butt up about a half inch and I'd wear longer socks. You and Baraki like to pull with like nothing over your shins. But yeah, so that little that little round, I, I don't think it's a problem to be clear. I don't think it's a problem. Uh, I just think if you want to clean it up, raise your hips up a little bit so you don't have to make yourself round a little bit. Yeah, it's not a problem. And again, it's just a thoracic spine. So not that the lumbar spine is inherently more dangerous, but all right. So last community form checks, this is 335. Yeah, your hips move up a little bit before the bar leaves the floor. So I would raise your hips up just a little bit. The other thing is, it looks like you're looking down like right in front of you. I would look out a little bit more. So move your gaze out. And then at the top, it looks like your knees are still bent. So just stand up completely straight at the top. Yeah, your knees look still bent. I don't know if it's the sweatpants or just, you know, that they are bent, but I would move your gaze out. I would move your hips up about a half inch and I would stand up straight at the top. All right. This is a mishmash of form of things I've done in the last two weeks. So this is, was it five, 565? Yeah, you see my back unlocking a little bit. Lumbar spine stays in the same position, just that thoracic spine, yeah. I'm behind the bar. I just tell a little bit behind. Yeah, I mean, my, my knees straight, straighten out a little bit too soon, but this is still like pretty light for me. I'm just making it look hard. Golly, I just hate myself for that pull. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, dude, that was hard. So what is this, 585? I'm gonna pause this. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, so you notice I pause right below my knees, and that's just usually, uh, for me, that is a point uh, where I want to really work on isometric strength because I do end up missing heavy pulls right around that area. So just working on that. More pulls for me. It's like a deadlift episode. Was this 595? Yeah, you just watch the, if you watch the logos on the plate, that's one of the easiest things to do to make sure that your bar path is like reasonably good. Here's the thing I don't like about my outfit. The shorts are too short and the bar keeps getting stuck like right above my knees. <laughs> <laughs> just hated it. All right, more even more deadlifts. I don't know if this is like a deadlift heavy episode, but I filmed a lot of stuff and then I just, uh, here's what we have. So these are the mid shin rack pulls. This is how I like to set them up. I just use these, the tops from jerk blocks. You can use like a couple mats too, but this is how I set mine up. Yeah. This is, uh, what is it? 260, so 572, beltless. Main thing is you gotta start with the shoulders over the bar. So a lot of people will do these and set them up so high where they actually can get behind the bar. Don't do that. That one was a little forward. Yeah, that one was better. The one before that was way forward. All right, so this is 550. You know, I don't like filming with the wide angle because it looks funky. Yeah, that was probably right at parallel. I'd make myself go a little deeper, but at the same time, I've literally never been called on depth. So less concerned. 550 for a double when training 
not been going that well. I think this is like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, something like that. I was doing doubles and this is 500 or 507. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, it looks fine. I just, you know, I'm the tempo is wrong on the descent. It's just slow, but which I need to handle heavier weights more often, but I just really hadn't been doing that. Um, but now I got the meat on the horizon, more heavy weights. This is 405. I believe this is in Philadelphia. I like that it's out of focus. That's my favorite part about this video is that it's out of focus. But yeah, 4, oh, 445, whatever the hell the bar weighs. I think it's an 80 pound bar. So maybe that was 450, four, whatever. Yeah. What is this? 335? No, 155, 341. I think I'm doing, was it one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three? Yeah. So I think I'm two count paused. Yeah. Yeah. The thing I don't like is you can see the bar still moving. So you want to stay tighter on the chest than I'm doing there. So when you're doing paused up, the idea is hold the bar completely still. Don't just let it like bounce around. What is this? 177, 392 for a dub. Not bad. Again, haven't been doing a lot of heavy singles, haven't been doing a lot of heavy weights and period, you know, um, just more, a lot of rep work. So out of practice, but this is what, 160, so 352, paused bench. This is in Philly. Yeah, that was pretty easy. And when I'm looking from this angle, so this is a little bit more weight. Again, I'm just looking at a bar path. I can see myself pushing it back towards a rack. It's gotta go back towards a rack right off your chest. Just like that. Pretty good, not bad. So this is one kilo more than what I just did and touch and go. So this is two, this is where I fail, three, four. No, I just didn't do enough reps to fail. All right, so that is it from training vlog number 27. That is a mishmash of training videos uh, over the past like month. Well, I actually think most of them are for the last two weeks, but anyway, we're gonna get back in a regular habit of doing these training vlogs. We're gonna get more stuff from Austin, more stuff from Leah, more stuff from Alan. Don't worry, but hey, if you wanna submit your own form checks, media at barbellmedicine.com. If you have questions you want us to answer here on the YouTube channel, send them media barbellmedicine.com. If you liked the video, hit that like below. If you wanna stay up to date on all of our latest YouTube media related things, hit subscribe. We'd love to have you be a part of our channel, a part of our community. As always, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. Catch you guys next time. See ya.